pleasure to be here and, and speak about how the nature of science is changing today due to all the, the different components of the NIPOB program. And it has been really a remarkable journey over the last 20 years. So I would like to talk a bit about big data in science. And what we see is that the science, the scientific data is doubling every year. And as a result, every area of science is changing. It's becoming increasingly data driven. And all these changes are happening as we speak. So right in front of our eyes. And all the data sets which are generated are also becoming increasingly open. So in 20 years ago, the, the data that astronomers have taken at a telescope typically were and ended up on the shelf as magnetic tapes and were typically read once and analyzed by one person. Today, people actually get upset if their data is not used by others. And but what we see also that these changes are non-incremental. So, so it really changes the, the fundamental way we do science. And we also see that through these computational techniques, we see an emerging convergence between physical and life sciences, which is increasingly apparent in how we do more and more of first principle numerical simulations. So we are trying to build mo models of the brain, et, et cetera. And also how a lot of the techniques that are, are applied in big data are shared between particle physics, astronomy, genomics. But it's not just the big petabyte and hundreds of terabyte data sets which are important, but basically scientific data as almost everything in nature and, and in society has a long tail. And so the long tail is just as important. So for every one terabyte data set, we have thousands of gigabyte data sets and millions of kilobyte each data sets. And we have to deal with those just as well and they represent the same challenge. But what is remarkable about today that we are right now undergoing a revolution, in a scientific revolution, how we do our discoveries. And this is, doesn't happen all that often in science, that, that we actually hap happen to live at a time when such a discovery, uh, such a revolution is taking place. So this was just from the New York Times not too long ago. So that the explosion in DNA sequencing is just about happening. So several speakers today have mentioned this. And so we are, so over the last two weeks, several people came into my office and said, well, I'm looking at data sets of thousands of genomes which are going to be emerging over the next year or so. It will be several petabytes. What do I do with them? So, so it's, it's right now imminent. So it's not a problem that is com going to come next year. It's, com it's going to happen this year. So science is changing as a result. And if you look back a little bit, so it took thousands of years of science to grow through an empirical period where we recorded nature. We took star charts and then Leonardo did drawings of the turbulent flows. Then starting with Kepler, we tried to write down analytic equations and solve them, which culminated in general relativity and Einstein, and this took a few hundred years. Then starting at Los Alamos with Fermi and Ulam, we were actually solving these equations numerically because sometimes a solution was so, so complicated, even if the equ equations themselves were simple, like those of turbulence. So we used computers to solve and we developed com computational science. And what is happening now over the last few years that we see data intensive science, data intensive discovery emerging, which is kind of synthesizing all of this. So it, con so it contains empirical data, it contains the, contains the computational simulations, it contains machine learning, so how we actually derive knowledge from all this data. And this, this requires a new way of thinking. <coughs> so we see these multifaceted challenges. So we don't just need you know, faster computers. We need different algorithms. We need to have a different way of looking at it. And we have people who are trained differently. And so <coughs> we also need new computer architectures, which are much more, so which are quite different from the supercomputers that we used to think about, just about the large simulations. And science is also increasingly moving away from the traditional hypothesis-driven uh, discoveries or hypothesis-driven science to actually where we derive our hypothesis out of data. 
And it was really remarkable to see how the astronomy community adopted this work so easily. And it really always puzzled me. So when we were working with Jim on the Sloan Deep Sky Survey, until I really realized in a discussion with biologists that astronomy has always been data driven. So when people hundreds of years ago saw the first, detected the first supernovae, there were little things that went ping on the sky and we didn't know what they were. But we then started essentially to follow up. So we derived these different hypotheses and tested them on other telescopes. So generally, it is now bec this philosophy is becoming much more accepted in uh, all areas of science. So uh, does anyone know what this is? OK, this is the first microscope. So it was already mentioned earlier by Eric. So this was Van Leeuwen Hoek's microscope. And today we are faced with the problem that we have yet to build a real microscope for big data, for data. So we, what we have right now is looking glasses. But, but when, we, when Leeuwen Hoek looks through the microscope, a whole new world opened up. And, and this is what, we, what is facing us tomorrow. So what is scientific data analysis today? So the data is doubling, and we are starting to hit petabytes today. But again, it's not just the big data, but small data is growing as well. Data is everywhere, so we need very fast networking to move the data around. The architectures that we have to deal with are increasingly CPU heavy and actually rather IO poor. So this is generating problems even when we are running our biggest simulations. The scientists where there was a survey done by Edinburgh people last year, and they found that scientists are typically today spending 90% of their time on data management, of their research time. So this is basically too much. Most of the data analysis is done on small to bit sized pair of clusters, typically put into drone plotets. The university is the power, we are hitting the power wall. So basically the buildings are melting down because we spent so much of the, our power budget on computing. So soon the data stream is starting to be so large that soon we cannot even store this. So this is not scalable and not maintainable. But this is great because this is exactly the world when people are getting desperate when new ideas are easily floating to the top. So we, so we, are, we have to reinvent how we, how we do this, the science in this new era. And I had the privilege to work with Jim and this was a remarkable journey. So we worked together on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and he tried to codify uh, the approach on how, how do we do science with these big data sets. And he really firmly said that scientific computation that is coming is revolving around data. We need a scale out solution for analysis and he was envisioning the cyber bricks where basically the disk controllers would be powerful enough computers that you can just build walls of them to do the computing. Then also, we have to take the analysis to the data when we have too much data to easily move around where our computing is. Today, this is very accepted and we are building these big data centers and clouds where we do the analysis right on top of the data. He also understood very quickly that not all data is being created equal. So he told me when we first met that, tell me your 20 queries. And then I said, what 20 queries? Or, or we want to ask from the data anything and everything. I said, no, no, just sit down, give me the 20 queries. And I scratched my head. After a few minutes, I was able to come up with the first five. Then it took me another half an hour to do the next five. At 15, I gave up, so after 15. And it is really very true, so when you confront scientists with this, it takes a while to understand that, that uh, basically there are some really, really important data that we have to be able to analyze very, very quickly. And there are some data which we have to keep track of and because eventually we may want to go back every once in a while. So a lot of the, so I think already the fourth paradigm book was shown. I think it's a great tribute to Jim's uh, whole life and accomplishments. So I really urge everyone to have a look at it if you haven't done so, so far. So we started to work together with Jim on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which in 90, it started in 92, and I was a cosmologist who was doing theory and statistics on the galaxies, and every, all of us had to sign up to do some part of the instrumentation, and, and I signed up to do the archive, because I wanted to do statistics with the data. Luckily, I met Jim shortly after, and he came to the rescue. He liked collaborators who are desperate. And we definitely were desperate. So tens of terabytes in 92 were, was, a, was a big data set. 
in the end, the project to the, took a little bit longer, so in the end it took about 16 to 18 years to finish. And in the meantime, the 10 terabytes have grown to 120 terabytes. The database that we projected to be half a terabyte grew to 35 terabytes. But luckily, there was more slow and try their slow. So, so basically, we were able to catch up and, and deal with it. But this is a wonderful, the Sloan survey is a wonderful example of something where through computation, we changed the way we do astronomy today. And this was a partnership between the Sloan Foundation, the National Science Foundation, DOE, and NASA and a bunch of the universities of the country. And through Jim, actually, Microsoft had an enormous contribution in this as well. And so together, we built a sky server, which was a front end to the data. And it turns out that we saw that our audience is 10,000 professional astronomers in the world. After five years, we looked at it, and we had more than a million distinct users. And what we also saw that where do these million people come from? They are basically people who are genuinely interested in science and wanted to play with the data. And some truly uh, original discoveries were made, for example, by a Dutch school teacher using the Sloan data, which was observed by a Hubble Space Telescope and the VLA radio telescope. And the Sloan survey now became the archive and the database became the world's most used astronomy facility or instrument today. So this means that the community was able to actually adopt and this shows that there are broad sociological changes on the horizon. We change the way we do science, also the way we collect data and the way we analyze data. There were decades when scientists were building up into big science. We were building up bigger and bigger science projects. But now with the data being made all public and open, now individuals can come into these archives and make original discoveries in small teams. So this is a fantastic evolution. And <coughs> what we also see is this convergent. And I would like to reflect the, what sort of people do we need in this world. And the traditional scientists are eye-shaped people. So they are very deep in their own field, but also very narrow by the way we train people today. And an interdisciplinary scientist today is T-shaped. So we, if he, is, he or she is still very deep in one field, but has a shallower but broad knowledge across multiple disciplines or multiple areas. But what we need today is people who are at least pie-shaped. Pie meaning the Greek letter pi, so they have to be deep in yet another field, like uh, computer science. They have to have the computational thinking. They have to know statistics, and they have to apply all it equally. So they have to be equally at home in these disciplines to, to basically make a difference. And this is where also there's this new emerging trend of the importance of data in high performance computing. So I think several people, David and Kathy, have reflected on this. So HPC is becoming a new instrument in their own right, in its own right. So it's not just the accelerators and telescopes which are pouring out data. And the largest simulations today are approaching petabytes. And most of the scientific community now is increasingly comfortable in analyzing these large simulations. So we need to create also an interface, a mechanism, how we can make some of the largest simulations in our respective areas of science public and enable thousands or tens of thousands of people to be able to use it as if it was just observational data. And there are a whole bunch of new challenges emerging here. How do we move the petabytes of data to a convenient place where it's publicly accessible? How do we look at it? How do we visualize, basically, petabytes? We have to do the rendering server side, so basically do, doing the visualization, driving them remotely. We have to do the immersive analysis, for, so we have to come up with new interfaces. And we also have to come up with new statistical algorithms which scale to petabytes. So summarizing, science is increasingly driven by data, but both large and small. Large data sets are here. The obvious uh, cuts solutions are not. But, but we are desperate enough to actually work very hard on inventing the new ones. We see a changing sociology from sci for science, both in the way how we collect and analyze data, but also how we move now from hypothesis driven to data driven science. We need new instruments like microscopes and telescopes of data because we want to look also the, at the big picture from afar and also micros at the microscopic details. We also have a problem with the long tail. We have to create a Facebook of scientific data where we bring all the different little data sets together and suddenly amazing connections will appear. The same pr problems are present both in business and society. 
and the data is changing not just science but the society as a whole. And what we see a new fourth paradigm of science is emerging, a which requires a convergence of statistics, computer science, physical, and life sciences. And it's I think represents very nicely what NITRD has been all about. Thank you very much. So the, the question was that given these changes in astronomy, has the education in astronomy five cents has changed? Not very much, to be honest. And so it, there will be a lag time, I think. So it, what is obvious that actually a lot of the use of these new emerging internet-based facilities and query engines is actually done rather through the graduate students. So it's not the faculty members who change, but it's the graduate students who have adopted past tests. And I think when they, some of them will become faculty members, I think that's when we see the, but already we see new class, new types of classes emerging, but not necessarily in the astronomy department, but rather actually across. So I think a lot of schools are thinking about cross-cutting for these master's programs, where we would start teaching the science and data intensive science, not just in astronomy, but. Yeah, just you were talking about opening up science to internet-based uh, uh -huh. scientists, but isn't there a conflicting trend that you would have to have enormously powerful computers in order to look at big data? Uh, does this tend to limit the analysis to a small number of elite universities? Or? Not necessarily. So I think there will be certainly some problems that will require very large computers, but, but again, so there are a there is a whole class of problems, for example, where the citizen science or social computing has been e extremely successful, where we still don't have good enough algorithms that resemble still the brain. So that's, that's one part. The other is that when we have lots of little diverse data sets which are right now still disconnected, I think if we, if we were able, I think a lot of the analysis of those doesn't require enormous computers, but requires a different organization and an ability somehow to make connections. So, so I, I don't think it's, again, just a brute force problem. So, so we have to think about this differently. I don't think we have a good answer yet, how, how to tackle particularly small data problems. Great. Thank you. Thank you.